Welcome to Boucher and Bistro, created to showcase great cuisines of the world paired with the beautiful Boucher wines. My name is Maria, I am a said sommelier, but more important, I have a great passion for wine and food from all over the world. And usually, here with me, a uh, host in the kitchen is our estate chef Marty, but since he's exploring great flavors of South Africa right now, I have another guy who is actually every bistro Hi, with us, but uh, he's the man behind the camera today in the kitchen with me, Robert Fisher. Welcome. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Maria, for having also, me. Also, our wine educator here, so man with a lot of hats. That's true. Well, and cheese lover, which is I was going to say, much class. like Maria, I am a big cheeseophile, so I'm happy to be here with the show today. Yeah, and um, I uh, completed the course with the University of Vermont as a cheese specialist, and we decided to have a special edition yeah. today for our bistro and uh, feature one of our favorite uh, teams, wine and cheese. Absolutely. So we're going to discuss different styles of the cheeses, how to create a cheese board, and what is the philosophy behind the wine and cheese pairing. So I have to say, what kind of cheese do you like? And when you go to the shop for the cheese, what are you looking for? Well, uh, so Maria, as she was just mentioning, uh, is a, got her certification in cheese from the University of Mo Vermont. It's, it was a very rigorous course. I helped her filming her final presentation. It was incredible. But I've come to know that Maria is a huge fan of Parmigiano Reggiano, the king of cheeses, as she likes to say. I grew up with an Italian mother, so I too grew up loving Parmigiano Reggiano as the king of cheeses. Aside from that, um, I'm a big fan of, uh, you know, for a soft cheese, mozzarella for something mm -hmm. very fresh, and I'm a big Gouda fan as well. Nice, yeah. yeah, great. And that's always beautiful to look for the different styles of cheeses. And uh, so fresh mozzarella, mozzarella mm. di buffalo, oh, yeah. burrata are uh, great cheeses. We don't use them on the cheese boards, but they're great uh, to add to the salads, yes. uh, pastas, pizzas. Yeah, well, Maria, I would ask the same of you. Besides Parmigiano Reggiano, what are some that you usually go for? Oof, that's, uh, you know, what is uh, amazing about the wine and world and cheese world is there is always something more to taste and explore mm -hmm. and learn, so that makes it more fun. Perfect. But uh, what I found, especially years ago, I always loved the cheese, but I would go to the cheese shop and there are like hundreds of cheeses. I cannot pronounce half the names, I'm not familiar, I know what I like and they all look great, but I'm not sure what flavors and textures I'm going to get if I purchase randomly cheese, right? Right. So um, we can discuss a little bit about that, how to start, how to buy the cheese. Um, and we um, chose some seven cheeses today, but learning just these seven cheeses, that will help you actually to apply this knowledge to a much uh, bigger variety of the cheese as well. So we can just look at the cheese and already um, say something about it. We can go beyond the label. Uh, looking at the cheese can tell you something about the flavor and the texture. And here we have a Briat Savarin. Uh, it's a triple cream cheese, but um, you can often see actually, you know, in a cheese shops, this kind of the rind. It's called Bloomy Rind and that's a soft ripened cheese. So I already know this cheese will be very creamy, buttery, has really rich mouthfeel. I chose Briat Savarin. There are a lot of others in the same category like Saint Andreas, the Lise de Bourgogne, uh, also double cream like Brie, Camembert. So they all have that kind of bloomy rind. Do you usually eat the rind or? Well, you know, for me, I kind of do it uh, based on cheese by cheese. Mm -hmm. If uh, I always give the rind a little bit of a taste mm -hmm. and if I like it, then I'll incorporate it with the cheese. Sometimes though, I only want the softer, creamier flavor and texture. So I'll go with those. Exactly. And definitely the, the middle part, uh, you know, will be more uh, neutral flavor mm -hmm. while wine will have more intense. Uh, bloomy rinds are absolutely edible. Uh, well, you eat it. It's a personal choice. I do uh, enjoy them together with the cheese just because they add some extra flavor. Uh, kind of a little mushroomy herbaceous, yeah. especially if it's aged uh, for a little longer. And, uh, you know, and, and again, it's all personal preference and how you're feeling that day, exactly. but sometimes the little texture, the little harder texture is nice too mm -hmm. to add. And, and if you are yeah, in doubt, yes, they're all edible. Um, then we can look at the telagia, right? So this uh, orange, kind of orange uh, rind will also tell us something. That means that these cheese, as well as, for example, at Poise, are uh, washed rind cheeses. So I can expect very pungent aroma. They also 
commonly known as a stinky cheese. Mm -hmm. uh, very particular, you love them or you don't. Uh, but you know, if you don't, then just keep that wine, right? Yeah, because there you go. <laughs> they'll be very intense. They're delicious, but very aromatic, and we have to be careful when it comes to the wine pairings as well. I know when I uh, cut and handle those cheeses, my hands are stinky for hours afterwards. <laughs> Then you need a glass of Riesling, oh. and they will really work well. Sounds perfect. Uh, <laughs> and then we have this, uh, I don't know if you can see this. This is called uh, Cavatina uh, cheese. It's actually goat cheese. And you can see this wrinkly rind. So this kind of rind, uh, it's a soft cheese. It's made from the goat milk. And we can mm -hmm. see the color, right? Yeah. Goat milk, it's always really white. Why? Because. Um, Unlike the cow's milk or a sheep, actually, uh, it does not absorb the carotene, so they're always really bright white. Oh, okay. And um, this wrinkly rind, it's almost always exclusively related to the goat cheese. That's very interesting. Mm -hmm. I did not know that. And this one, it's gray. So do you know what, where that gray comes from? No, I, I don't, but you can definitely get a distinct flavor off it. What's going on yeah, with that? Yeah, that's the ash. That's a vegetal ash, oh. and uh, common in, a, in a goat cheeses, but you can find in a cow's milk, like a Morbier, famous cheese, uh, oh, has yeah. a ash in the middle. And the purpose of ash there is to actually separate the morning uh, milk versus the evening milk oh, in the wow. same cheese. And we can talk about that later. Yeah, I'm very curious to see what profile. the ash in the rind is going to do. That's wonderful. And then we have the uh, Pecorino Camomilla. So uh, this is the cheese, uh, Pecorino. It's a sheep cheese, right? Uh, it's uh, covered in the chamomile flowers. It's a really beautiful cheese, um, seasonal, made only two months uh, uh, during the year in the spring when a sheep graze on a chamomile and they also coat the wheel in the chamomile flowers. Something to consider when you look for the wine pairing mm -hmm. because that will bring definitely strong aroma of the chamomile. Yeah. But there's some wines that really pair nicely with that. And that would be like, um, speaking of the textures, yeah. right? We have the softened cheeses, then we have the, this would be the semi-soft. Mm -hmm. I try to uh, cover all styles on the cheese board, or at least basic styles. So we have the soft, yeah. semi-soft, semi-hard, and hard cheese. Oh, it's perfect. That will really give a lot of options to the wine pairings. Now, do you find um, when you're doing your wine and cheese pairings, do you tend to lean towards one of the textures that you like the most with wine, or is it different depending? It's really depending on a wine. I do love the, that creamy, buttery when we taste with the bubbles. That uh -huh. would be contrasting pairings, oh, yeah, and we can talk great. about it later. Uh, then we have the Manchego cheese, and I do like also a cheese that has a kind of crumbly, crunchy uh, salt, uh, the Christos. Uh, Manchego, very neutral on its own. Uh, it's a semi-hard cheese and really great for the for the wine pairings. Mm -hmm. um, then, as you mentioned, king of the cheese, uh, <laughs> Parmigiano Reggiano, and I have to show this, and we can talk Please. about it later, right? This is the the stamp um, issued by Consortium uh, in Emilia Romagna, because that's the only place in the world that re uh, real Parmigiano Reggiano can be made, following very strict rules. That's the um, hard cheese. This one it's aged for really six months, and uh, this cheese can be made only in one place, oh, made nice. in a certain way, and it's produced in the same way since 1800. So a lot of history here. Wow, that's very um, cool. And it's a lot to free cheese, some interesting, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking for that. Uh, it's, uh, when you taught me that, I was fascinated by that fact, yeah. yeah. And then we have the Rockford here, which is uh, the blue cheese. Right, and we love him a little further than others because we have to consider, right, when we make our cheese board to, to, to put the cheeses distant from each other because they all have more or less strong aromas. We don't want right. that to interfere Absolutely. Um, between themselves. I'm looking forward to, to taste the cheeses, but I'm excited. <laughs> so, what we said, right, you want to uh, uh, cover different styles of the cheeses. Uh, different milks. I, we have here three mm -hmm. cows, a uh, goat, and a sheep. Yeah. And something interesting if you have a three glasses of milk, each, right, cow, goat, and sheep, okay. which one do you think has the most fat? Well, I would assume cow. That would be my guess. That would be actually my guess too, but the real answer is a sheep milk. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I'm very curious. That's really yeah. interesting. Huh. 
I guess sheep must live in colder temperatures and they need the more fat to keep yeah. them warm. <laughs> and they do make delicious cheeses, especially this like semi hot. They're really nice. And oh, creamy nice. And rich. Yeah. And I want to encourage all of you uh, listening in as well. Um, as we're doing the presentation, if you have any questions for Maria, being the real expert, or hey, I'm happy to throw my two yeah. cents in too. But uh, any questions for us, by all means, feel free if you want to unmute yourself and ask away, or you're welcome to type them in the chat and we can read those as well and answer them yeah, for absolutely. you. Absolutely. We would love all this right. to be interactive. Absolutely, yeah. Well, Maria, what do you think we should start with today? Um, and so for the wine that you chose oh, today, yeah, that's right? right. <laughs> and, and when we talk about wine and food pairing or wine and cheese pairing, there is something to consider. That would be the texture, intensity, or body of both. Why do we pair wine and food? Because we want them to complement each other, to highlight both. Nothing too overwhelming. It's all about the balance. Mm -hmm. um, so if you have a lighter body wine, you'll go with lighter body cheese as well. And you can also do complementary pairing and contrastic pairing. So we will have both today. So why is this selected? It will be the Brut Rosé, so our dry uh, sparkling wine. Uh, then we have uh, Las Brisas Vineyard Riesling. Uh, then we have the High Vineyard Chardonnay. Uh, we have the G Vineyard Pinot Noir. And we have Cabernet Sauvignon. All righty. I'm excited. Perfect. Well, so I know which we... wine we're going to be starting with. Yeah, <laughs> that was I know. I was going to start with the bubbles. Um, and so, as I said, we have the, the Briat Savarin, which is a triple cream cheese, very rich, very creamy, mm -hmm. very buttery, while we have sparkling wine, um, which is dry, very crisp, has very bright acidity, very citrusy notes. So, oh, so what yeah. do you smell in this Brut Rosé? Well, one of the things I personally get a lot out of this is a little bit of like a sour red fruit characteristic. Mm -hmm. So maybe you could say like uh, cranberries or raspberries or something yeah. like that. A, little, a lot of tartness in this I wine. I definitely find yeah. tart fruits, citrus, like a citrus pink too. grapefruit, oh, yeah. pomegranate. Very refreshing. Yeah, pomegranate for sure. And when we pair the wine and cheese or wine and food in general, we always taste the wine on its own. Mm -hmm. To see how it tastes on its own, that food and then wine again. And that's the best way to see how this aftertaste of both are matching each other. All right. That's delicious. Mm. And then let's try some Briot Savarin. All righty, let's do it. So that will be the, the, the contrast pairing, right? Because we have the rich, creamy, buttery yeah. cheese, and now we have the bubbles and bright acid increase. It will cut nicely to it. Absolutely, yeah. Um, um, similarly, um, well, uh, I'll start cutting some cheese for us. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I really like to do is because, as Maria's saying, I'm uh, the contrasting food pairings and wine. They work very well for me, and so when I'm going to have something that's got this real crisp acidity to it, you know, a lot of brightness mm -hmm. in the wine, I love a creamy, um, rich food to go along with it. So I might even do this with something like Alfredo mm -hmm. sauce or something like that too. Perfect. Oh. And what we choose, right, are these neutral crackers. You can take baguette. Uh, I do suggest going with the neutral uh, crackers mm -hmm. without any herbs because that might interfere with your wine. Absolutely. Or crackers with like dried fruits and sweets, something to avoid. Because always be aware that your wine should always be more sweet than the food. Absolutely. And uh, that's something I think we could talk about too. But let's get to a little taste action here. Oh, that knife after and you? you can see all different knives. So um, if you can, the best will be to have different knife for each cheese. That way you are not mixing and interfering the flavors. That's right. Cheers. <laughs> mm. Mm. So very, mm, very salty, very creamy, very rich. Yeah, it's very salty, exactly. And, you know, the salt is a turbocharger for flavor. So salt from the cheese wow. very hazy aroma from the wine. My goodness, uh, just right away. I, that cheese is much mm -hmm. saltier than I expected it, in the best way possible. And then you take the sip of the wine and the flavors just explode afterwards. Oh, yeah, explosion afterwards. of mm -hmm. all these fruits we, we mentioned earlier. Oh, and my goodness, And then you have yeah. that kind of uh, bubbles that cut through the richness and clean your palate for the next bite. Mm -hmm. um, mm. And I find that since I got like a big piece of rind here, I find that the flavors of the rind are very grassy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A little mushroomy, very intense. I enjoy that, but as I said, it's... it's well, perfect example. 
my first bite, I also had a lot of rind in my first bite, but not really in my second bite. And I preferred the rind this time around. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's always good to just test and back and forth and see what you like. And to look for some local cheeses, so the same style will be Mount Tam, Cowgirl mm -hmm. Creamery. It's a cheap little cream. Oh, yeah, really absolutely. Delicious. Mm -hmm. I know actually I noticed that um, they use different kind of rennet. Oh. You probably oh. noticed when you read the, the, you well, know, what maybe... cheese is made of. Only because we're friends and I talk to you about cheese do I know what this is, but maybe we can explain for the folks yeah, at home so what this rennet is. Milk, salt, rennet, right? So rennet is the enzyme found in the stomach of the lamb or calf. And actually, uh, that's the enzyme that coagulates uh, the milk. So basically responsible for converting milk to cheese. And um, traditionally, and, yeah. it's an animal rennet. Wow. And so how do... Um, you know, the cheese makers, they, they actually use this enzyme from the animal stomachs yeah, to make cheese. That's that the traditional method. That was discovered method. thousands of years That's ago when they were transferring uh, milk in the, in the stomach of the animal. And they actually, the, the calf or lamb, and they noticed that it uh, created the curds. Wow. Oh, and my so, God. And that <laughs> it's used for, for thousands of years. Uh, nowadays, uh, you can find also vegetal rennet. I read that they're not all uh, stable like the animal uh -huh. but there is an option oh, okay. and they can extract them from the nettle leaf and some other herbs so. well that's that's i mean and here i thought stomach was only good for tripe and haggis it's but there, now i know wonderful cheese yeah, yeah that's awesome Alrighty, what do you think we're going to be so trying now, next? Uh, we had that uh, Briot Savarin with a sparkling wine, and that was a conscious pairing that was delightful. Mm -hmm. And wherever you were entertaining, having triple cream, uh, cheese, and uh, bubbles, absolutely great way to start any party. Um, but if you uh, we are talking about complementary pairing, uh, I will go with a high Chardonnay, which will okay. be the third glass, uh -huh. right? A little darker yellow inside. Uh, it's uh, it's we can say Grand Cru Wiener here in Caneros. Uh, makes really beautiful, complex, very intense wines. Mm -hmm. um, and that will be, and definitely this wine has a lot of structure and it's very rich and it has some creamy mouthfeel with the, the creamy cheese. That would be complimentary pairing. Yeah, absolutely. So let's taste the wine taste first. Taste the wine first. <laughs> Very intense, like mm. lemon, uh, lemon curd. Uh, Big lemon curd. Um, you know, I get a little, little, I don't know, a little, uh, little earthiness to it almost in a way. Uh, you minerality. know, a little umami, mm -hmm. minerality. Very lush. Uh, and, you know, speaking of the wine and cheese, uh, you can actually find a lot of similarity that we maybe not don't think about it. Yeah. But, you know, when you go deeper, you can really find like Chardonnay is a grape. They really change the personality depending when it's grown and Absolutely. depending on the winemaking techniques. The same grape made in, for example, Burgundy, let's take Chablis region in, uh, in Napa Valley, oh, will yeah. be very different wine, the same grape variety, yeah. right? That's, uh, that's one really neat thing uh, for folks at home to know about Chardonnay. It is, uh, you hear it a lot because it's uh, one of, if not the most widely planted wine grape in the world. And it grows in many, many different conditions, yeah, but the flavors means. will change depending on the and, conditions. And you will definitely taste that uh, Napa Valley sunshine. Even mm -hmm. Caneros, where we are, it's a cooler part of the valley, still warmer, sunnier than uh, Chablis in Burgundy. So yep. I'm going to get a little bit of tropical notes here, Absolutely. like a pineapple, mango, yep, uh, ripe, uh, uh, that lemon. But uh, Chablis will have a more green apple, citrusy, really mm -hmm. bright acidity. Cooler climate will definitely reflect there. Then different soil types. Then different oh, yeah. uh, winemaking techniques. Chablis, uh, the, you know, if it's aging oak, it's a neutral barrel, so you don't get uh, oak notes. While right. in Napa Valley, you can uh, find the French barrels or American oak. We use French. Oh, yeah. Uh, definitely the toasted nuts, um, you know, kind of Marcon almond comes with comes oh, the yeah. wine as well. Um, and the same is for cheese. So the cheese made in the same way from the same, um, you know, here we have a grape cheese, we have the milk from the right. same cow milk. Uh, will be very different depending on the part of the world where it's made. Absolutely. Even cheese from cheddar from Wisconsin versus cheddar from Oregon will be very different. Oh, Why? Yeah. Because of the different terroirs. So wine and cheese rely on terroir extremely. Yeah. Uh, different soil, microclimate, mm -hmm. um, because animal graze on a different vegetation, different soil types. So one will be more intense, another will have a little different flavor profile. And to, you know, to speak of terroir and the whole idea of you know, these, 
these little changes and subtleties in a climate, in a region with the grasses, all that are going to make noticeable changes in not only the cheese, but the wine as well. Exactly. Uh, in uh, partnering with, uh, you know, doing all our virtual tastings that we do and partnering with the cheese uh, company out of Oregon, I've come to learn that their cheese, we're talking the same herd of cows in the same field of grass, the cheese they make in the spring tastes different than the fall and the winter and the summer because the grasses are different. That's the time of the harvest. Yeah. It's the same for the grape. If you harvest the same grape earlier or later, you will have a different level of ripeness, different flavor profile. Mm -hmm. The same is for the cheese. For example, this pecorino camomilla, it's produced only in spring when the actually sheep can graze on a fresh camomile flowers. So yeah. it's not that they only coat the wheel in a dry camomile flowers. Actually, the cheese itself has a kind of floral aroma because oh. that's what sheep eat. That's amazing. Amazing. And, you know, the, the Parmigiano made in spring will be very different than one made in fall because vegetation is dried in yeah. fall. Um, well, I can't wait any longer. Let's get yeah, to some exactly. cheese with this uh, Hyde Chardonnay right mm -hmm. here. So let's, uh, I would definitely try again a little bit with uh, the okay. Fiat Savarin. And for everyone at home, uh, what Maria was talking about, since you can't be tasting the wine live with us, the biggest difference for sure is the texture that you get out of it. It's... Um, it's so much creamier and richer with the Hyde Chardonnay. And so now we're going to get the idea of a complementary wine and food pairing with the similar aspects. So you can see it's very runny, but that's fine. And you want to take your cheese out of the fridge, softer cheeses, 30 minutes uh, prior to the tasting and one hour for the hotter cheeses. Why? The cheese as well as the wine if they're cool, too cold, they mute its aroma. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, oh, and again, just what a difference right? that makes such a difference in the flavors of the wine when you pair it with the cheese. I mean, that high Chardonnay was doing one thing before I tasted mm -hmm. the cheese, but then after getting all that creamy texture in your mouth, it's, it highlights the creamy texture exactly. of the wine. Really, really, so which one would be your favorite between these two? Well, you can decide. All I'll say is this, it made both wines better to have them with the cheese. Yeah, and cheese, so it's, yeah, it's definitely a perfect match. Yeah. Um, and, and speaking of the different, um, you know, wine and cheese, the, the similarity, aging, mm -hmm. it's very important. They both change as they age. Cheese, as it ages, becomes drier, more intense. Yeah. Right? And the same is for wine. Wine changes its flavor profile. Oh, yeah. Um, cheese making techniques, as well as the wine making techniques, can also change the wine. So it's amazing how similar they are. Uh, I broke Maria's golden rule of not using, of <laughs> you mixing our knives and our cheeses. So I'm going to go That's wipe that fine. one off so we can get to a little Telegio. <laughs> Yeah, so especially with Telegio, definitely we need to be careful because it's a very pungent cheese, right? It's very intense. Um, All righty. Well, let's give Telegio a little would bit. Would you of like Telegio maybe next? Or maybe the goat oh, cheese? Oh, you tell me. You're the let's effort. Let's do the goat cheese. Okay, absolutely. Goat cheese is also soft cheese. Um, something that I always notice when I have like fresh goat cheese, it's uh, that kind of chalkiness, right? Mm -hmm, absolutely. It's really white and... Um, very really strong good. aromas, very strong flavors to it on the and, palate. And this one has its ash. It looks really pretty too. Yeah, no. I love the wrinkly rind. Um, one of the delicious cheeses, uh, this was Andante, which is a, it's a local cheese. Uh, one of the well-known, it's Latour from Piemont. That looks mm. like a little cake with a wrinkly rind. Looks really pretty. Now, um, which wine do you think we're going to uh, be pairing with I the... I would uh, actually taste with the Riesling. The Riesling, let's mm -hmm. do that. Now, one thing uh, I think that's worth noting about Riesling is, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of wine drinkers, especially in the United States, we have the wrong impression of what makes a good Riesling and what a Riesling should be tasting like. Uh, a lot of us, you know, we think immediately, oh, I hear the word Riesling and I think it's going to be this extremely sweet wine. But that's not really the case. I mean, when we talk about world-class Rieslings and, and the one we do here at Boucher, um, our winemaker, Chris Gajani, got a very high point score on this mm -hmm. wine right here. Um, the whole thing the winemakers after with the Riesling is they really want to highlight the acidity aspect of the wine. And then they leave just a little bit of residual sweetness mm -hmm. from the grape juice behind to just balance that out and offset yeah. that acidity. And, and, and exactly. And, you know, Riesling, sweet Rieslings from Germany are really delicious. Oh, yes, they um, are. <laughs> and there are also a lot of, like, dry Rieslings. If you definitely want a dry Riesling, you can go to France, to Alsace. It's always dry. You can come to Bouchain as well. Mm -hmm. um, you can go to Italy. You can go to Austria, Australia. So a lot of dry Rieslings around the world. 
but sweet reasonings I enjoy with the spicy food, mm -hmm. Thai food, uh, you know, Sichuan, some cuisine with super there. challenges, Riesling will be the safe choice. Riesling and spicy food make a very nice combination with each other. All right. Mm. A lot of stone fruits. Oh, yeah. This reason, like a peach, apricot, right? A little citrus. Wow. That is, um, mm. that's incredible, that cheese. Now, we're definitely getting into a, a little bit of a firmer texture compared to yes, the Briat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And has it, uh, the rind has that kind of very earthy aroma. Yeah. It's, and so, sorry, everybody, I'm going to be doing my best mouse impression during the tasting today because that's perfect. you got it. That's a way to learn. Exactly. That's absolutely right. And, uh, you know, for anyone who may not be aware, you really want to incorporate your sense of smell in everything that you eat and drink because your nose and your smell receptors actually taste many more flavors than what your tongue and your mouth process. So it may look silly to do it, but I'm going to be smelling our cheeses as we're oh, tasting no, today. that's what we did during my classes and I actually found so many aromas that they have not thought about mm -hmm. before. Mm. Okay. I think it's really nice with Riesling. I was also thinking about Pinot Gris. Oh, yeah. Uh, some crisp whites. Uh, some whites that will have a little earthy notes as well. Um, I oh. will stay away from red, but if you really want a red, I will go with a really light Pinot Noir or some other light red that has very soft tannins mm -hmm. and some earthy notes as well. So for me, this cheese really highlights the tropical fruit aspect mm -hmm. of the Riesling. Yeah, it's really beautiful, and the Riesling, I see mm. from the Riesling, cuts through the, through the cheese. And it's interesting, too, because you know it may be a little tough for everyone to see on the, the camera, but there are actually a couple different textures going on here with this cheese. Uh, you know, we have the rind on the outside. We have a little bit of a softness, you know, on the edge of the rind, you know, like the Briat Severine, like that level of softness. But as we migrate more to the middle, we get a little more of a denser, firmer texture to it. So a lot of action happening in that cheese. Yeah. And Maria, I just have to ask now, since it is such a unique thing, what do you think the ash on the rind specifically is adding to the cheese? I find, so it's protect cheese from, uh, you know, oxidation. Okay, that's well, very but interesting. But flavor profile definitely add a kind of earthy component. Mm -hmm. um, and ideally, in general, goat cheese, fresh goat cheese, it's a perfect pairing with like Sauvignon Blanc. Oh, yeah. Uh, because it's a high acidity cheese, a high acidity wine. It Absolutely. has a kind of herbaceous notes as well. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, I find it kind of little mushroomy, uh, mushroomy kind of notes. Awesome. Um, mushroom powder I like get that. that big time mushroomy especially <laughs> yeah. on the aromas as well mm. now there is my damp forest floor that's what I was looking <laughs> exactly. for <laughs> it's really delicious all right what are we going to be trying next um, and so next uh, I'm thinking about we can do telegio if you would like or okay. my heart pecorino well, let's, you, let's do telegio the telegio so okay actually, we're going to we're going to get very nice. stinky mm -hmm. now <laughs> so uh, we can do telegio um, yeah let's go ahead and do that you a little bit of the rind too. Mm -hmm. I'll put that on a cracker for you. Perfect. There you go. You. And right away, so this one I can just tell by cutting it, a little deceiving. It looks as soft as the Briette Savarine, but definitely mm -hmm. a little bit firmer texture than that. All right. So yeah. Riesling? Yeah, I would do Riesling. Let's do so it. So there's something like Epoise, for example, which is a typical uh, Burgundy uh, wash wine mm -hmm. cheese. Uh, what they and there's saying that really works well. What grows together goes together. Um, I totally agree. And uh, yep. in Burgundy, they will often pair that uh, Epoise, mm -hmm. Bavosh wine cheese with um, the Burgundy white or red, Chardonnay or Pinot Noir. Mm. Very mm. savory, very creamy. Very creamy. Salt salty component to it it's very salty mm -hmm. it's pungent not like it was the legio comes from lombardy lombardy in mm. italy yeah oh yeah you know since you mentioned it was mm -hmm. i'll share with the folks at home maria and i before being with bouchain we worked together at another company as well and at that company was a gentleman who is his official title is he is a cheesemonger and he actually um manicures the uh, largest cheese selection in the Napa Hundreds Valley. Of cheeses, yeah, yeah, over 200 cheeses from all around the world. And um, I did get to try that at mm -hmm, with him. Mm -hmm. And uh, wow, that is a pungent it's cheese. Very intense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So why, uh, wines to pair with that kind of cheese will be Riesling, Gewurz Schaminer, uh -huh. uh, perfectly. Oh, yeah. uh, basically any Alsace varieties will work. Uh, mm -hmm. If you like bread, I will go with the Pinot Noir. Okay, yeah. Or maybe unoaked Chardonnay. 
um, not, I wouldn't go with a rich, creamy battery Chardonnay, mm -hmm. it's more crisp, like overall style. I think I agree with you. Might just be a little too much with the, with this complimentary pairing in mm -hmm. that regard. I would maybe do a little more contrasting. Mm. And then we have a um, Pecorino Camomilla. Let's give that one so a taste. As we said, made in spring in, uh, in Emilia Romagna, and this is one of the unusual rinds. Um, there are a lot of fun cheeses with different rinds, so fresh flowers, dry flowers, um, jasmine flowers, uh, poppy flowers, uh, nettle leaf. But, you know, uh, keep that in mind. You can uh, actually when you see the, the little pairings. clump of flowers right there that go into the rind. It's incredible. Yeah, and that will be the semi-soft semi cheese. So it has a really nice. nice creamy texture. And actually, wine I had in mind uh, from a Bouchain portfolio was a high Chardonnay because Let's high Chardonnay that. has the kind of uh, pronounced like yellow flowers. I agree with you on um, that. Big time on that yellow flower flavor. For one of my projects the, during the... This um, class with University of Vermont, I used the uh, Vouvray, which is Chenin Blanc from France, from Loire Valley. And uh, Chenin Blanc on its own smells like a chamomile flower. So it was really beautiful. Oh, hearing. wow. It's amazing. So if you like to experiment and try something a little different, um, try with the, with the Chenin Blanc. Nice. Well, let's give it a try. How much? And I do eat rind. As I said, it's a oh yes, choice, on this one for sure. It really gives nice. Um, you can have in a, even a, in a nettle leaf. Oh okay. And a um, lot of lot of different options. This is the one thing I do like about the uh, mm. the more firm cheeses is I can just pick them up and eat them. Delicious. <laughs> mm. Oh. And, and you can see the cheese even without the rind mm -hmm. has a really nice floral aroma as well. But that rind is a really serious component to the cheese. And it's a very complimentary pairing. Oh my gosh, yes. Right? Oh, it brings you out the floral aroma. Brings the out the best of the Chardonnay, exactly. really. Oh my gosh, that's incredible. You know, I will, this reminds me, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we, uh, you know, here at Bouchain, when we do our virtual tastings, we have a wine and cheese option where we pair, uh, we partner with a company out of Oregon. Their name is Rogue River Creamery. Very wonderful cheeses. Well, one of the cheeses I got to try from them was they, um, I purchased a, uh, it was a cheddar with lavender seeds all throughout it. And I paired that with our uh, Syrah that we do here, okay. our Hyde Vineyard Syrah here at Boucher, which also has a lot of those cut purple flower oh, notes ooh, to it in, in lavender in a big way. And you can't even imagine how that cheese and that wine that just really accentuate you right. That complimentary pairing brought that lavender out, you know, 10 times what it would have been with just one, either of those on their own. Yeah. So that was a really great was moment great. for me. Yeah, and a uh, barely buzz cheese. Oh, yeah. Cheddar also a great coated one. with um, a lavender and espresso mm -hmm. powder also really pairs nicely with uh, with a Syrah because That's it's really big, matching uh, the flavors. A big Napa Valley favorite, the barely buzz. Yeah, many, many delicious. different uh, establishments around here carry that one. Mm. Now we're going, we are moving closer to our uh, king of the cheese. That's right. But let's have some Manchego first. So, let's do it. Uh, Manchego will be semi hard cheese. Uh, when in doubt, go with Manchego because it's neutral. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can really pair with any wine. Uh -huh. um, and um, I love because the Pinot Noir, it's a lighter body wine, and I think it really goes well with Manchego. Wonderful. Um, so let's try the Pinot. This is a G Pinot Noir. The vineyard is located right here in Carneros. Right. It's made from the old vines. It is located right across the street from us here and at Machine. And the are 50 years old or mm -hmm. older. And what that means, it means it's actually older vines. You get a lower yield, smaller quantity, but very good quality grapes. Very nice fruit concentration. Uh, a dry farmed as well. So absolutely. that shuts your wines more. And, and, you know, you want your vineyard really happy, but not too happy. Stress exactly. Good, right? <laughs> you know, uh, I'll tell you a cool, cool little tidbits about the G Vineyard. So that is owned by a gentleman who's great friends with us here at Bouchain. Comes all the time. We see him, uh, have a wonderful time with him. His name is Dr. Paul G. So Dr. G has owned the G Vineyard pretty much the at the exact same moment that the current owners, the Copelands of Bouchain, took over this winery and they have had for the last 40 years an exclusive contract with him where we're the only winery period that makes wine from his grapes and as maria was telling you it is they are some special grapes they're dry farm they're very old vines very stressed out extremely concentrated flavors. And they can really age beautifully if you're a patient enough. I, I, in fact, you know, for as a Pinot Noir, this one usually shocks most people yes. for the first time they try yeah. it. Uh, I've had many guests tell me, had I not told them it was a Pinot, they would have guessed Syrah or something of that level of heaviness. 
but really nice kind of mushroom and cedar mm. and cherry and it's really well balanced it's beautiful Very, wine oh well, big time but, cedar big time darker you know heavier fruit notes to it try manchego. Mm, rich red you fruits. can also go with the gouda which is oh, one of yeah. your favorite absolutely cheeses. Um, you know and speaking of gouda um because uh, you know as i mentioned maria and i worked previously with that cheesemonger keith well, he told me that the real pronunciation of Gouda is actually Howda, and that's how they say it in the Netherlands. So, uh, for you, Keith, I love Howda. Yeah, he should be one of the guests in a few. Oh, years. I would love it. He's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, Play some board games with him too. Yeah. Oh, he is fun. Mm. And there is something about mm. um, you know salt, fat, and protein. Um, how they do work magically with the wines, with the tannins. Of course, Pinot Noir is very light tannin structure, but we can notice that. It will be more pronounced if you pair with Syrah or Cabernet, more tannic wines. Um, that, uh, the same like if you have a black tea and you put a little milk in it, that polymerizes the tannins. The same, it's a wine and cheese. Mm -hmm. Basically, salt, fat, protein will be, uh, make your wine silky, much softer. You know, actually, since you bring that up, mm -hmm. I have a very interesting question for you. So, growing up in an Italian family, when I have this Manchego, it would be on a charcuterie board along with Genoa salami and prosciutto, and there'd be black olives and all things like that. Smile, your guests were very happy. That's right. I was very happy. My mom did all the work. My aunt too. Uh, but you know, with that being said, people really do make these very deluxe and elaborate mm -hmm. cheese and charcuterie boards with all these other items on there. Is there anything you think that is especially good or especially bad for including on your cheese board when we're doing a wine pairing? And, and that's actually excellent questions. Excellent question. So um, I would ask, what I often see is that people like put cheeses next to each other, like okay. almost melting over each other. So every cheese has its particular flavor, more or less intense. So we want to make a space between, right? That's a great point. Uh, and then, uh, if you can choose different knife or at least for similar cheeses, so don't cut the ledge and then bring a celery that will okay. really bring that aroma to your cheese. And then, um, you know, you, you want to fill up the gaps. We just did cheese class today, but if you do charcuterie board, right. I will definitely add some nice jamon, uh, iberico will oh, be great. Wonderful. Prosciutto, uh, Prosciutto spec, de Parma, yeah. some soppressata, some nice salami. Mm -hmm. uh, even I love spicy food. I will avoid very spicy salami okay. because we are pairing with wine. So, so maybe that might not a chorizo of, with the wine. Yeah, yeah. so something a little milder okay. in flavors, right? Um, uh, speaking of like nuts, I will add uh, Marcon almonds. Oh, yeah, okay. Cashews, macadamia nuts. Uh, definitely to avoid the almonds with the skin because skin can cause the bitter aroma in your wine. So really Something that would just add tannins on yes, tannins. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's go with neutral, salty almonds. That's and I really could great. see the Marcona almonds, the cashews, that's going to add a lot of um, fatty oils mm -hmm. and saltiness yeah, to your palate as well, which would be great. Yeah, so that would be good. As I said, neutral crackers, plain mm -hmm. uh, baguette, uh, you know, that's uh, definitely with softer cheeses, you need some vehicles, so you, you need yeah. something like that. But go without any flavors, dry fruits in it, um, jams and honeys, as much as I love them just with the cheese, uh, I definitely do not put them on any uh, cheese and wine pairing mm -hmm. uh, menus, so just because uh, your wine should always be more sweet than your food, and if you put the honey, which is delicious, but sweet, right? right. That will mute the, the, the fruit aroma in your wine and make wine taste bitter and sour, so it wouldn't complement the wine, it will ruin it. So, Jams, yes, when wine is not involved. Well, that's that's great advice. Thank you for that. This manchego was delicious. That is. Um, again, I'm having flashbacks to childhood. <laughs> I think we're uh, going now to our favorite. We uh, have to do it. <laughs> Parmigiano Reggiano. So, um, and so now we're talking about um, fuller body wine and fuller body cheese. And... Um, have you noticed when you eat Parmigiano Reggiano or extra aged Gouda that I used to call them salty crystals with the crunch? Absolutely, that crunch, yeah. yes. So do you know what these are called? No, I don't. So these are called tyrosines. Okay. The salty, the, the, the crystals, the crunch huh. you find in an aged cheese, right? Like okay. Parmigiano Reggiano and tyrosines actually help to uh, the stimulate the, the production of the um, serotonin. What? So eating this cheese literally make you happy. 
So how amazing is that? Uh, okay, so it's not just a coincidence that I'm happy when yeah. I'm eating Parmesan or Reggio. By all means. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So you always want another piece, and you have excuse to do that. That's so. right. You got to stay happy. Mental health is very important. <laughs> and um, so we are tasting it now. We have full body cheese. So now we are going with the full body mm. wine, and this is our Hall Mountain Cabernet. Hall Mountain, one of the uh, the most well known growing regions mm -hmm. of the Napa Valley. Yeah. And the reason, um, just for in case anyone's curious, the reason we source for this Cabernet in particular, we're sourcing the grapes from Hall Mountain is. As Maria mentioned earlier on, Bouchain, where we're located here in the Napa Valley, when she was talking about the flavor profiles of the Chardonnays, this is the coolest climate region of Napa. And generally speaking, it does not maintain a hot enough temperature on average to ripen, properly ripen Cabernet Sauvignon. So we have no choice but to source these grapes from a warmer climate section of Napa. In this case, one of my absolute personal favorite growing regions, which is Howl Mountain. Yeah, and it's a very high elevation. Yep. We have mountain fruit here, so uh, more than 2,000 feet, very different microclimate than a very valley floor. Cooler days, warmer nights. They have this less extreme you know, shift yep. compared to the valley floor. Volcanic soil, which always gives it kind of minerality, bright acidity, some mm. kind of I'd say fairly stressed vines. You always get mm -hmm. wonderful concentrated fruit coming off that area. Dark fruits. Dark fruits kind of for uh, sure. Blueberry. Oh yeah. Um, blackberry, cherry. See, that's what I'm getting all on this one. Little dry herbs. As oh well. yeah. yeah, on the on the finish, a little lingering effect of the the dried herbs for sure. And let's Great. taste with our Parmigiano Reggiano. To the king. And it's amazing, actually, how and you know, next time you you have a Parmigiano Reggiano, take it at one hour before and and smell mm -hmm. it. It's amazing how many flavors you find here. It's very actually tropical. Pineapple. Oh yeah. They even found like uh, um, essence of the, very similar to the pineapple in, in a Parmigiano Reggiano. Um, a coconut, mango. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, you know. As they say, uh, smell is the sense most closely tied to memory. And all I can think of is as a kid, I used to go in the refrigerator and just eat huge bites out of the Parmigiano Reggiano, mm. in which case my mom would yell at me because we needed enough for our pasta at night. So it was always a big issue in the house. <laughs> but you were ready to take that. So. Uh, there was no joke. Sometimes for me and my father, she would have uh, hidden ingredients because she knew we would eat them and steal them before dinner time. So. <laughs> Decoy yeah, dinners. Who can um, resist to the Parmigiano Reggiano? And it has a kind of mm. not nutty flavor that oh. kind of get more intense by aging. But I'm, I agree dry, with you. Right? As I smell it, I get big time pineapple, mm -hmm. big time tropical fruit. That's salty caramel. Salty on the palate. And it's a very complex cheese, mm. right? A lot of layers, a lot of flavors. And so we saw a mention for the soft uh, ripened cheeses. You are welcome to eat a rind. Um, but for the and you can even eat on, on uh, washed wine cheeses yeah. they're uh, edible mm. not always desirable right but for the parmigiano reggiano it's a hard rind as well as the manchego yeah so you're not going to eat a rind but uh, it's actually you can use the rind of parmigiano reggiano to put in a in a soups and a risotto oh pastas, my really god brings <laughs> this nice umami flavor you know one thing i noticed with it too is you know as you guys can see i'm holding it i'm, I'm squishing it it's a it's a hard cheese but as you put it into your mouth, the heat from your mouth really almost melts, melts it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And turns to a kind of creamy texture. And then that puts a texture in your mouth. And it's great that we're pairing this with such a full-bodied, rich and heavy wine like the Cabernet Sauvignon. Because unlike all the other cheeses, we, mm -hmm. you know, we take a sip of wine, bite a cheese, sip of wine. After that, I taste the wine when I take the next sip of wine. On this one, even with such a strong wine as Cabernet, that flavor of that parmigiano reggiano stays in my mouth and that's really what i'm getting as the lingering finish in the combination and, and did you notice how tannins because this is still considered as a young cabinet so many tannins right. become much more silky lighter than the <laughs> it's as if there were no tannins after out. i exactly but, mm -hmm, and, that's and true that's, uh, so richer wines um fuller body wines with fuller body cheeses like actually could have really work well um comp they will be great uh, oh yeah a lot of Cheeses, you know, there are a lot of fun cheeses like raclette, right? Oh, that yeah. you can melt over um, the best fondue cheese, raclette, yeah. absolutely. Um, so yeah, it's um, all right. Difficult to choose a favorite pairing. I know it's tough. Well, I think we obviously saved the strongest cheese for last. And, and there is the a Roquefort. reason for it, right? It's a Roquefort cheese, um, and um, so. 
some cheeses are delicious, but they are challenging when it comes to the wine pairings. Yes. But with the right pairing, they can be delightful. And we can say that for gorgonzola, in general, blue cheeses. Mm-hmm. They're more or less pungent, but they are very intense. And um, Riesling, of course, will be the good match. But in general, any sweet wines, like Sauterne, oh, yeah. uh, late harvest Riesling, um, Fortified wines like sherry, port, Madeira, the pairing will be amazing. That's oh, yeah. a contrast pairing. And then you have that kind of Absolutely. offset sweet and salty that will kind of highlight the, the wine as well. And then I see different the wine cut through the creaminess of the cheese. Um, so, you know, one thing I'll, I'll mention too is obviously we're having a Roquefort, a French blue. Uh, you know, as a lot of um, the blue cheeses that we tend to see when we go to the store and we're out in the market, uh, especially, you know, the crumbled blues, things like that, that is what's known as a Danish style of blue cheese mm-hmm. where they're really shocking the blue mold into the cheese and it's it's happening much, very, very quickly. And those tend to be extra sharp in flavors, extra potent, really, really hard to pair those blues with wine. However, on the other hand, you have what's known as the French style of blue cheese. And I would say that Gorgonzola falls Mm -hmm. into this category as well, where it's a little more, still very blue, but a little more mild, much creamier texture. And those blues are really much better for wine pairings, I would say. Yeah, I agree. And I'm uh, having a glass of Riesling again. And this will show you something. When in doubt, go with the wines that are a safe choice, like Riesling, Mm -hmm. lighter reds, crisp whites. Um, and, and if you don't mind handing me the bottle of Riesling, I got a little <laughs> overzealous in my first tasting of it. So. <laughs> more, always more wine and more cheese. <laughs> yeah. This is not the worst job I've ever had. <laughs> All righty. Mm. Mm, and it's already like pretty soft, so it's yeah. very creamy. Mm. And the beautiful safety from the reason we just clean your palate and cut through that creaminess. Exactly. Richness. And that's one of the things when, you know, as you've mentioned uh, many times, the, the, co- the contrasting wine and food pairings, that's probably what my palate likes mm-hmm. the most is creamy texture in food sharper, crisper, uh, more acidic, bright texture in the wine. And there is a reason why we actually, and, and we said the Rockford will be great with the, with the sweet wines, Spotify mm. wines, like harvest, and we leave the Rockford blue cheese for the end and with the sweet wine for the end. It's kind of perfect way to, you know, oh. um, and they mellow each other out. Mm-hmm. It's all about, you know, when we're doing a contrasting pairing like this, it's the flavors balancing each other out. And yeah. The, the Riesling makes the blue less sharp. The blue makes the and Riesling less has sweet. Some sweetness kind of uh-huh. really it, it highlights. Well. Oh, it's wonderful. And something I didn't mention is like you can see that we cut the cheese in a different ways. So Parmigiano Reggiano, you don't want to slice it a slice, right? Right. Um, you Chunk want it. actually <laughs> to kind of uh, make it in chunks. That's how it should be served. So just have fun with that. It's a thing of beauty. Yeah, and then you. Have another one more piece. That's why I can't resist. And um, does uh, anyone have any questions for us? Yeah, please, while while we're here. I mean, I'll just keep eating cheese and yeah. drinking wine, <laughs> but happy to answer questions. Manchego, question. it's nine months old. Mm. Parmigiano Reggiano, 36. And uh, Parmigiano Reggiano has to be aged for at least 12 months. Um, if you uh, put them in a salad, that's what I like to mm. use to, to uh, put the 12 months old. Then 24 months and then 36. And then you have really aged Parmigiano 36 and plus. It's really delightful to uh, taste with um, uh, balsamic, uh, artisanal balsamic vinegar from Modena, which is basically just in a few drops. With Parmigiano Reggiano, it makes a beautiful umami flavor, and then you can add some prosciutto di Parma, and then you feel like you're in Emilia Romagna. That sounds great. And to I'm me. sure you will get some Ferrari too. That's so. uh, that's <laughs> right, absolutely. <laughs> oh, we have well, the French Grand Prix today. We'll see how Ferrari does. <laughs> we all have our favorites. That's right, absolutely. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us, well, and um, I'll cheers you with the cheese. Cheers with the cheese. Always um, <laughs> have more cheese and another glass of wine. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. And thank you for joining us today. Have a great Sunday. Cheers, cheers everyone. everyone.